Our first speaker today is well known to uh, all of you, Dr. Patrick Conway. Uh, he is someone who has a lot of titles. He is the Deputy Principal Administrator, the Deputy Administrator of Innovation and Quality, and the Chief Medical Officer of CMS. Uh, Dr. Conway is responsible for overseeing and improving the programs that serve the millions of Americans who access health care through Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and the marketplace, also known uh, as the exchanges. He personifies excellence in public service. He brings a uni unique background as a physician, a strategy consultant, and a researcher to his positions. And he brings a talent, a real talent, for problem solving and a tremendous passion for finding and increasing the quality and value of the healthcare system. Uh, he has received the Secretary's highest award for distinguished service. And with that, uh, let's welcome uh, Pat Conway. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I'll apologize for two things in advance. I am uh, sick, so my voice is a little odd, and I have to leave after I talk. I try not to do that, but uh, was told I need to be back in Baltimore for some things. Um, so uh, I, as was said, I've been chief medical officer for about five years. Uh, CMS is like dog years, so it feels like about <laughs> 35. Um, and true story, one of our communications folks the other day said, Patrick, you need a new picture. I said, why do I need a new picture? You look a lot older than when you started. So I went home and asked my wife, do I really need a new picture? And she said, yeah, you need a new picture. Um, so I will move through the slides uh, relatively quickly if I can. Um, uh, and I'll adhere to the time limit. Uh, so if you think about the Affordable Care Act, uh, three major uh, changes. Uh, one, uh, insurance coverage, we're at the lowest insurance rate uh, in recorded history for the United States. Had another set of data come out uh, yesterday. I won't talk much about that today. I will talk about health system transformation, delivery system reform, really focusing on the cost and quality of care. So if we go to the next slide. Um, this just shows a CBO uh, estimate from 2010 and then uh, looking again at 2015, uh, predicted over $20 billion uh, in uh, cost savings from reduced uh, medical trend. As you all know, both our own actuary and independent analyses now saying that a portion of this change uh, is due to structural changes in the system and delivery system reform. Uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, this is from Harlan Krumholtz, uh, who is a hardcore health services researcher. You don't have those kind of people often say jaw-dropping results in the New York Times. Um, just to call out a few of the results, this is from a JAMA study, uh, over 68 million uh, beneficiaries. Reductions in all-cause mortality from 1999 to 2013. This is also testing me. Uh, I don't have my glasses on, so this is, this is going to test to see if I have my slides memorized. Um, uh, reduction in mortality, reduction in hospitalizations uh, at a population level, so less Medicare beneficiaries being hospitalized even as the population ages and becomes more frail, uh, reduction in costs for inpatient admissions, and reductions of hospitalizations in the last six months of life. Uh, not on this slide, our own quality measures for CMS, so over 95% of the measures have improved significantly over the last three years. So uh, significant improvements in quality uh, across the US. If you go to the next slide, thanks, sure, I'll take it. Um, this just, and we'll test to see if I have to look at it or not. <laughs> this is our frame for delivery system reform. We talk about incentives. These are both provider and consumer incentives. Gets to things like value-based purchasing, alternative payment models. Uh, we also talk about care delivery, which gets to things like integration of mental and behavioral health true population health management, and also uh, engagement of patients uh, in their care through shared decision-making and other means. And then we talk about information, which is transparency about quality and cost of care, but also the right information at the point of care. I am still a practicing physician, uh, mainly taking care of children with multiple chronic conditions on weekends. Um, and I can tell you that that information at the point of care is, is critically important. So if you go to the next slide. This is a payment framework you do not need to memorize, uh, but uh, we published in JAMA uh, about 18 months or so ago now. Four categories of payment actually aligns with a lot of the private sector folks that you're going to hear from today and from a payment framework that was just released from our uh, Learning in Action Network. 
Category one, fee for service, no link to quality or cost. Category two, uh, fee for service with a link to quality or cost. Classic example would be hospital value-based purchasing. Category three, an alternative payment model uh, built on the fee for service architecture like ACOs or bundled payment. And then category four, true population-based payment to a provider. So these are all uh, provider-oriented payments. And you'll hear from private payers and others about how they're also uh, moving to value-based payment. If you move to the next slide, um, this, uh, the President and the Secretary announced uh, in January of 2015 specific goals for alternative payment models. So this is category three and four from the last slide, where the provider is accountable for quality and total cost of care. To hit 30% of payments in alternative payment models by the end of 2016, 50% by the end of 2018. Uh, we're settling this goal for the federal government, but importantly we said we want we want private sector actors, which you'll hear from today, to move in the same direction. Private payers, providers, consumers, uh, purchaser group, employers, et cetera. The second goal was value-based payment. We said at least 85% uh, linked to value by the end of 2016 and 90% by the end of 2018. You know, we are on track to meet those uh, 2016 goals. Uh, we also launched the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network. Uh, to really partner with the private sector to achieve these goals. We've got eight of the 10 largest private payers in the country. If you add up CMS and the private payers, over 80% of the U.S. population, uh, over 25 states engaged. You've got large employers. You've got over 1,000 provider groups. Uh, we just had a summit that had you know, people representing a, a huge portion of the U.S. population really driving to achieve these goals. So if you look at the next slide, this just graphically shows the goals, the dark blue, Key point on this slide, in 2011, we had 0% in Medicare in alternative payment models. We were at 20% at the end of 2014 and continue to grow. So it just graphically shows you the shift you're seeing in payment uh, in the U.S. The last thing I'll say here, and my uh, seven-year-old son has this stat memorized, C CMS spends approximately a trillion dollars a year uh, across all programs. That is more than two and a half billion dollars a day. That is more than 100 million an hour. So in the course of this two-hour discussion, 200 million plus. Um, our goal is how do you spend those dollars as wisely as possible? How do you partner and catalyze change that improves quality of care for people, develops and, and generates healthier people for our country, and is smarter spending? So on the next slide, this just shows our value-based payment programs. Key point here in the middle box, you can see hospitals right now have 8% of payment via readmissions and other value-based purchasing programs tied to quality and value. Physicians and clinicians are at 9% for large groups, 7% for smaller groups. But really showing that it's um, a significant amount of payment tied to the quality of care delivered to beneficiaries. On the next slide, um, I'm now gonna shift to the Innovation Center. So uh, started leading the Innovation Center about two and a half years ago. As you know, uh, 10 billion over 10 years uh, to, to uh, catalyze new payment and service delivery models to improve quality and lower cost. This lists all of our major models. I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I will talk about a few. Um, on the next slide, um, on our accountable care organizations, we've got more than 400 uh, ACOs in the Medicare uh, Shared Savings Program, uh, almost 8 million beneficiaries in 49 states plus Puerto Rico. Um, and with our Medicare shared savings rules, and we're working on another set of rules right now on some of the benchmarking issues, which we've said publicly, you know, we're looking to really improve this program over time. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results. The other important note here, if you think about Medicare, you've got 32% growing in Medicare Advantage. You've got 20 plus percent in alternative payment models. You already have a minority of uh, Medicare and what was traditional fee-for-service, and even within traditional fee-for-service, as I showed you, the vast majority of payments with a link to quality and cost. So on the next slide, um, this is our Pioneer ACO results. Um, first model to be certified by the actuary, uh, improves quality and lowers cost, uh, and then we built in into Medicare Shared Savings Track 3, the learnings from Pioneer. I think the other learning from Pioneer, now we, all our models, pe generally people can go in or out of. Pioneer, which, you know, first model out of CMMI, so, um, uh, you know, I think at that point we were at a different stage. Um, people could only exit, 
So by definition, the numbers are going to go over, down over time. That Every time one exits, it gets a lot of press. We've tried to explain this. I've given up trying to explain it well. Um, and I'm going to talk about a next generation ACO model, which we think uh, a number of these organizations now are deciding, do they go into MSSP track three, or do they stay in Pioneer, or do they move to next generation ACO? The key point is we want an array of payment models that meet providers where they are. And we have a fundamental principle that providers should have choices around those payment models as long as we're all driving to improve quality, lower cost. The quality results here, dramatic improvements in quality and in patient experience, um, and over $400 million in cost savings. So a successful model that met the bar of improving quality and lowering costs. On the next slide, uh, next generation ACO, we think there's some key uh, attributes here and got a robust interest. We hope to announce uh, the select dealer uh, entity soon, prospective attribution, so you know your population, full capitation up to full population-based payments, or uh, you can choose a, a lower amount than full population-based payment. Patients can select their ACO, so what we call voluntary attribution, but the patient says, or the beneficiary says, this is my accountable care organization, and then things can happen like rebates to the beneficiary to stay within network and also enhance care coordination services because the provider knows they're part of the network. Also waivers, things like telehealth, skilled nursing facility waivers. So really we're uh, in smoother cash flow and a benchmarking mechanism that is no longer just historical, actually looks uh, more similar to Medicare Advantage where you're looking at regional uh, benchmarking approaches. So on the next slide, uh, this just shows comprehensive primary care initiative. I grew up in a small town in Texas, but I have learned how to talk fast. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I don't want, you know, I don't want to take any of the other people's time. Uh, so this is our, one of our primary care models partnering with private payers. Uh, so in seven states and regions, Medicaid, Medicare, and private payers coming to the table doing a few key things. We agreed on 13 quality measures, exactly the same across payers. So squarely focused on a small set of quality measures for providers. We all are putting in per member per month population-based payments while we ask the providers to decrease total cost of care. First two years of results now, you see the one year on the slide, decreased hospitalizations, decreased ER visits, uh, high level of quality of care. And I think um, you know, we are in uh, the evaluation mode uh, for this one, but trending in the right direction in a positive way, and I think is a, what the future primary care could look like. On the next slide, because I do think anecdote sometimes brings it home, SAMA Healthcare, one of the CPCI practices, rural southeast Arkansas, They've got teams, four physicians, nurse practitioners, care managers, use the funding to get pharmacist support, social work support, et cetera, using their electronic health record to tier patients into risk categories, using telehealth to monitor patients remotely, doing home visits for their very frail elderly. The leader of this practice said a few key things. He said, first, my patients love it. You know, they don't, they don't know all the details of the finances behind it, but they love that they get called at home, they get their medications managed, you know, a clinician sees them in the nursing home. If they go to the nursing home from the hospital, they love it. He said, second, you know, I'm finally, I've been a family practice doc for over 30 years, I'm finally practicing the way I want to. Um, and third, I never would have done this. All the payers put in about a million dollars into this practice year one in population payments. They, by the way, brought down total cost of care more than three million. His point, that million dollar investment, he would have mortgaged his house five times over in Arkansas. He never could have made the transformation. So I think there's a key lesson here that we need to scale and spread, but when you invest smartly, set the outcomes you want for patients, for physicians, clinicians, teams can work with their patients and beneficiaries and achieve the results we want. On the next slide, uh, this is our state innovation work. Um, we've now got 38 uh, states and territories where we said, we want you to achieve better care, smarter spending, healthier people. You have flexibility about how to get there. We think there's some key components like population health, payment models, you know, workforce, et cetera, but lots of flexibility. Uh, we've got 17 what we call test states and 21 design states and territories. Um, test states are implementing their changes. A few examples, Arkansas's private payers together, redesigning primary care, over 80% of the payers in. They have a bundled episode that's literally Medicaid mothers through one year postnatal. So it's a bundled payment where if you invest in prenatal care, 
you decrease complications uh, postnatally for a Medicaid-insured child and are showing results in terms of quality and lower cost. Uh, Minnesota is doing accountable health communities, really linking uh, the social and public health, public sector with the clinical care delivery system. Vermont is working on all payer ACO type concepts. Uh, Oregon with coordinated care organizations. So, you know, really uh, exciting to see the state and local change uh, driven by these models. Um, on the next slide, Maryland, which uh, we're going to release the first year results very soon on. A uh, really interesting model where Maryland and the hospitals and the innovation center went through a process where we're moving Maryland hospitals to population-based payment. We said 80% by the end of by year five. So that means every claim would be 20 cents or less on the dollar. The rest of your payment is the attributed population around you, which we update based on an algorithm and pay them population-based payments. The Maryland hospitals actually moved to 80 plus percent population-based payment in year one. When you ask them, why did you do that to the CEOs, they say, you know, we figured we could have a foot in both boats and try to manage in two worlds, and then we decided that was going to be too difficult, so we decided to shift to population-based payments. So now, the way they're successful in Maryland is you invest in keeping people healthy and out of the hospital. So they're investing in primary care, they're investing in community-based services, and like I said, we're, we're going to release the first year results uh, soon, but we're very excited about this model. Next slide. Uh, transforming clinical practice. Uh, we are investing in supporting physicians and clinicians in improvement. This is an over $650 million investment, supporting over 140,000 physicians and clinicians uh, across all 50 states. And really, this builds on work from Partnership for Patients and other work we've done on a collaborative improvement where we help them set goals, improve quality, lower cost, uh, and improve population and health management. On the next slide, I just shows some of the goals. I won't go through all these in detail, but things like uh, decreasing hospitalizations, increasing appropriate use of care, and more efficient uh, care delivery. And we do think the model, uh, similar to Partnership for Patients, uh, can, de de can uh, demonstrate savings. On the next slide, um, and you can click through this one, uh, Innovation Center looking forward. Uh, we're focused on implementing models. Uh, evaluation and scaling is very different. Traditionally, CMS, you know, run a model for a number of years, then have a demonstration report uh, afterwards, you know, then contemplate what changes could be happen at CMS or by Congress. We're monitoring data monthly. You know, we do deep quarterly reviews in these models, and we adjust them. You know, the Pioneer ACO model got adjusted multiple times. Our bundled payment model has been adjusted multiple times. So we're learning with the participants and improving over time, which I think is a key fundamental uh, tenet. And we're also integrating innovation across CMS and HHS. Today, I didn't talk about oncology or health plan innovation or some of our consumer and advanced primary care work that's underway. Um, care choices, just to give two sentences on, is a model we launched where Beneficiaries for the first time ever will be able to receive hospice and palliative care services at the same time as curative care services. Relatively good evidence from the private market that that can improve quality of care, improve patient experience, uh, and lead to a more efficient uh, health system. So another model we're very excited about. On the next slide, this is the last slide, so I will end on time. Uh, what can we all collectively uh, do together? Uh, do focus on eliminating patient harm, focus on uh, better care, smarter spending, and healthier people for the populations we serve. Uh, really invest in the quality and the data infrastructure necessary to improve. You know, focus on transparency. Um, we do think health plans, which you're going to hear from today, are a major, can be a major driver of positive change. And fundamentally, we want to be, at CMS, we want to have a culture of collaboration, partnership, and improvement. So that um, I won't tell you about our lean work we're putting into CMS right now, but it's been a three-year journey. We're actually trying to model uh, the improvement we want from others. Um, and lastly, you know, test these new innovations and scale successes rapidly and relentlessly pursue improved health outcomes. I want to thank you for having me here today, and thank you for listening and all the work that you're going to hear about. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.